if you're a business owner, there's going to come a point where you need a stronger tech stack to have a clear picture of everything all in one place. From startup to enterprise, NetSuite is your one-stop solution. Visit netsuite.com slash SPI to download their KPI checklist for free and support this podcast too. If you do find yourself buried in manual work or struggling to have a clear picture of your business, you should know three numbers. 37,000, 25, and one. 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have been upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. 25, NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And the number one, because your business is one of a kind. So you can get a customized solution for all of your KPIs and one efficient system when, with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash SPI. That's netsuite.com slash SPI to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash SPI. There was once a time when building a website was a massive undertaking and a huge pain, something that you would need to clear your entire schedule for. Well, guess what? Those days are over, and now you can build a professional, sparkling website in just seconds, thanks to Hostinger. In fact, I recently did this, and I shared the process on my YouTube channel, and it was absolutely mind-blowing, especially considering it took like days on end previously when I first started building websites. This tool is amazing, and I was using AI to do it. So Hostinger is a top highly rated global web hosting and website creation brand, right? And all you have to do to build a website is answer three questions. Here it is. You enter your brand name, you select the website type, you describe your business, and then you can customize it further with a drag and drop editor. It's literally that simple. I just went through this process. I promise you, it is the easiest way to build a website. And it also offers some AI-driven SEO-friendly copy, an AI logo maker. Plus, they make all this super affordable. It's less than $3 a month, including a free domain name. So create a live website now at hostinger.com slash SPI. And listeners of this podcast can enter SPI for 10% off your order and a free domain name. H-O-S-T-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash SPI and use the code SPI for 10% off and a free domain name. It's incredible. Now back to the show. What makes me sad when I talk to people or consult them is when they believe they're doing something that will lead them somewhere when it never will. If you were to bake a cake without sugar, you wouldn't expect the cake to be full of sugar. If you were to build a business putting in your personal time, family time, flexibility, the more you put yourself into the business, the more the business requires of you. In other words, the biggest constraint to most people's business growth is the bottleneck of themselves. So that was Richie Norton. He's been on the show before, I think in episode 200 and something where we talked about product development, e-commerce and those kinds of things. Richie and his company, Product.com, has helped me and Caleb create the SwitchPod from engineering it to manufacturing it, packaging it, all that kind of stuff. The 3PL, third-party logistics and all that kind of stuff that's along with it. That was Richie and his team's doing. But today I'm really happy to bring Richie back on the show in episode 605. So we're talking 400 episodes later. So it's been quite a while. And Richie has been deep in philosophical work with relation to time management and happiness and finding goals and how entrepreneurs become successful. And he is with us today to talk about his new work, Anti-Time Management. And I challenge him a little bit on this. And you know the reason why is because aren't we supposed to manage our time so that we can allocate our time in the places that it should be and, and all that kind of stuff. And coming out of this conversation today, I mean, I have this huge realization of the fact that, you know, goals aren't really where it's at. I mean, goals are important, but there's something even more important beyond that that we should be striving for. And we unlock and unpack all that today. And everything in Richie's book is just incredible. And I love this. It's a pretty deep conversation, which we sometimes have here on the show. You know, I love the tactics and strategies and your step one, step two. And there are exercises and things that you'll actually be able to do alongside this conversation today as you begin to listen to it. But I love going deep. I love chatting with Richie. He's just such a cool guy. And I want to love and support him so much. So here he is, Richie Norton. This is session 605 of the Smart Passive Income Podcast. Thank you again for joining me. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast, where it's all about working hard now, so you can sit back and reap the benefits later. And now your host, he still hasn't ever beat his father while playing chess, Pat Flynn. Job searches can feel like they're taking forever, a real slog. So stop searching and just match with Indeed. 
So ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, messaging, so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. If you want to hire fast, you need to go where the talent is. Get unparalleled access to job seekers with over 350 million unique visitors globally, according to Indeed data, and an extended reach through Glassdoor. I love how adaptable Indeed is uh, as well, whether you're hiring one person or you need lots for a scalable project, like hiring platform that lets you schedule and interview hundreds of candidates in one day, like there's no other one that you would wanna use. So join more than three and a half million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at indeed.com slash smart passive. Just go to indeed.com slash smart passive right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash smart passive. Terms and conditions apply. You need to hire, you need Indeed. If you're at a desk a lot like I am, it is really important to move around and increase circulation as much as possible. And a sit slash stand desk can be a massive game changer. If you haven't tried one before, this offer from Uplift is for you. Plus you can support the show at the same time. Visit upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. Uplift Desk is the place to go. There are so many customization options, plus free 30 day returns, free shipping, free accessories with every desk. And did I mention the industry-leading 15-year warranty? It's no wonder they've been wire cutters pick for six years in a row. Plus, they offer a great range of ergonomic chairs and storage systems if you want to give your whole workspace a makeover. They even have an augmented reality feature so you can see what your new desk will look like in your space using your phone. I mean, they even make a height-adjustable conference table that doubles as a regulation-sized ping-pong table. These folks have really thought of it all. And if you want to build the workstation of your dreams, I highly recommend checking them out. Just go to upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. That's U-P-L-I-F-T desk.com slash SPI to get 5% off your entire order. Richie, welcome back to SPI, my friend. Thanks for coming on today. Dude, I love you so much. I'm so excited to be here. We're going to have so much fun. <laughs> Dude, I love you too, man. And I just have to always thank you for the work that you've done to help me and especially me and Caleb on the Switch Pod. You and your company, Product, has just done so much for us and continues to do so much for us. You even like stepped up and were like, you know, gave me things for the Deep Pocket Monster channel, like our coins and our patches and stuff that people are going crazy over right now so thank you for always taking care of me i appreciate you no you're welcome we have we have a great team at product tfn and jace and they just keep coming up with ideas but you're easy to work with because you're so awesome you know that right <laughs> well what makes it hard to work with somebody i'm curious when they don't want to be helped you know what i mean they're like never mind i'm gonna do it on my own you know like <laughs> Uh, dude, for those of you who don't know, I might have said it in the intro already, but Richie and his company at Product help entrepreneurs create like physical products, whatever you can come up with, they will help you do that. And they help you engineer it if you need it, like they did with with a switch pod, they can help you ship it and package it and you know, all that kind of stuff. It's just incredible. But we're going to talk about something even more incredible today, which is something you've been working on for quite a while now. I know you're very proud of it. I'm stoked because I uh, got a look at it early. And it's your new book. Your last book was amazing, and I know it's done very well, but what's different about this book? What's the new one called, and what's it about? Well, well, the last one was called The Power of Starting Something Stupid. And what's interesting is I, I remember you holding that book in your hand before we even knew each other. You know, like, I think maybe the book, I'm not sure how it all happened. It happened through John Lee Dumas, but at one point you had that book in your hand, you're sharing it with your people. And the book, The Power of Starting Something Stupid, did really good. You know, Brene Brown blogged about it, Steve Forbes, Covey, Jack Canfield, all these great people endorsed it. What I realized, though, was people would come to me with their stupid idea, but they didn't actually want the stupid idea. They w wanted what they thought would come from it once it was successful. So someone, like, like this will make sense. Like someone will come and say, hey, I want to make this thing. I go, cool. It's not hard. If somebody wants to buy the thing when you make it, it's not hard to turn that into a business. There's a demand for it. People buy it. It grows. It scales. But for the entrepreneur that didn't start the business just to sell pencils or whatever they were selling, who started a business to create, wanting to create more time for their family, more time for travel, more time for autonomy, you know, these things that you talk about all the time, they totally miss the boat. So that's why this book is called Anti-Time Management, because it actually moves beyond what's the thing you say you want to the thing you really want. It moves beyond habits. It moves beyond strengths. It moves beyond goals. 
It moves beyond business and projects to actually the reason you're doing the thing. You know, I learned a lot from the Coveys and they would say, you know, begin with the end in mind. You know what they, they didn't say? What everyone gets it confused. They didn't say begin with means in mind. Everyone confuses goals, habits, strengths as ends when they're just means, they're just tools to get us somewhere. So anti-time management reverses the whole process. It's actually pretty unique uh, to help you put what you really want to create immediately at the center and work from it instead of endlessly towards it. Yeah, give us an example of something maybe in your life that uses anti-time management. I mean, when I first heard the title, I'm like, wait, we're all striving for better time management. Like, are you saying like screw time management and like, let's not worry about our calendars and time blocking and all these other strategies to help us, you know, achieve what it is that we want to achieve? Like what's going on? It's a good question. I'll give you some examples. Just just real quick. I had to go deep into this work and research to like get here, you know, and, and to even be able to say this. But time management was never designed to give people time ever. Suddenly, recently, it's crept into the self-help vernacular. But it was designed during the Industrial Revolution. It was a tool made to control every blood, sweat, and tear that was dropped by every worker. So it's not about, the, the key word here is management. Management's control. So the question is, who controls your time? Under traditional time management, your boss controls your time. It was never designed. E even today, when they give you benefits of time off, that is designed so that you work harder and stay with the company retirement benefits stay here till you're 65 so 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 the whole idea of time management is a great idea when we're trying to apply it to like have more time and be free but the actual principles of time management don't lead us have you ever like worked on something really hard you have your whole calendar full but you feel like you got nothing done in an empty life yeah that's why it wasn't designed for that it's not a tool for that so what's the answer? <laughs> the answer is anti-time management. <laughs> <laughs> Read the book. Go get it. Yeah. So, so the idea is you move from time management where they control your time to anti-time management where you control your time. You move from time management where they take your time to you anti-time management. You create your own time. You move from they took your space to you create space. You move from they took your choice to you make choices. And you say... I'm already doing that as an entrepreneur. And I'd say, cool. Most entrepreneurs I know, and probably you too, except for some that are exceptional, they started a business to get their time back, get their life back for their family, only to end up losing their time, their life, and their family to the business. Yeah. <laughs> over and 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 over again. And you're like, <laughs> it, I, I tweeted out something yesterday that said, when I got laid off, I was so happy to escape the nine to five, but I ended up working 12 hours a day. So, in order for me to actually, you know, benefit from the freedom that I thought I had, I had to recreate those boundaries that I once had as a nine to five, you know, worker. But now I'm, I'm my own boss this time and, I'm, and I have the reasons and the why behind it now. You actually said exactly what, what where I was going. It, and, it's, and it's a perfect example is what happens is we continue as we move from I was at work. I learned leadership. I learned management at a place as we move from traditional corporate organizational behavior work to our own business, solopreneur, entrepreneur, founder, whatever you want to call us, we bring with us those time management principles and strategies and tactics to the new workplace. This is why we don't have what we were actually looking for. Sure, you can make a business successful, but if you left the business right now, would it keep running? It doesn't matter. Do you want to be running it? Can you take your kids to their baseball games and can you watch their recitals? Can you take six months off? These might not be your goals. The whole idea of anti-time management isn't necessarily, for me, it is more time, more freedom, more flexibility, but it could also be just to work more and work harder and be more productive and have more time for that. It's whatever you want at the end of the day. But let me, let me give you some reasons why. So some of your listeners may know this and you know this too, and I'll go through it quicker than I would do if I was going to go like super deep into this part, but you know, my brother-in-law passed away at 21. He is never going to grow up to be 65 and retired and live the American dream. It doesn't exist. My son died as a three month old after catching pertussis. He's never going to be able to grow up and do these things. We had, we had foster, we had three foster children. So I have four boys, three foster kids. The foster kids were with us for a couple of years full care, love them so much. You know, they ended up 
a leaving. We wanted to adopt them. You know, it, it's the system. It's a whole thing. In that sense, it hurts in some ways different and sometimes worse than the finality of death because we don't know where they are. My wife had a stroke and lost her memory. She got a bat. My son got hit by a car crossing the street. He should, he literally should be dead or quadriplegic right now. And he's out riding these big 20 foot waves. Now we got lucky. I, I say that because we don't go to work for work's sake. We don't. We go to work for the sake of something else. We create businesses for something else. We do what we do for something else. So the idea of anti-time management is to work from that something else and to make it like, try to make it even a little more real. A real in the side of a metaphor. If you were to bake a cake without sugar, you wouldn't expect the cake to be full of sugar. If you were to build a business without putting in your personal time, family time, flexibility, how can you ever expect this business to create that for you? It was never baked in from the start. In fact, you cement systems so that five or 10 years later, when you finally want to leave, you're forced to sell because you never created a system that created an environment where you could have what you wanted. You drop a rock in the water and it expands. Well, the more you put yourself into the business, the more the business requires of you. The more you put your values into the business, you can value your time instead of timing your values. And it grows your business better because now you have positive constraints that allow you to think differently and problem solve for your real goals. In other words, the biggest constraint to most people's business growth is the bottleneck of themselves. But if the business is able to work and run in a way that allows me to live my values from the start, there's no failure. The projects might fail here and there, but I'm still able to do the things that I need and want to do. Architects don't build buildings. You're an architect. They draw them. General, general contractors don't build buildings. They won't even pick up a hammer. They sub the whole thing out. The job of an entrepreneur is to put things in motion, not to do everything yourself. And you can do that with anti-time management. So help the person who's listening to this who is at the very start of their journey where they do feel like they have to do everything, they have to pick up the hammer, they have to you know, wear all the hats, et cetera, and they're feeling stretched thin. They're feeling like they are kind of lost. How can the principles in the book help them at this point? So let's say you got to do what you got to do, right? You're going to do whatever you're going to do. You're going to do whatever works. What makes me sad or when I talk to people or consult them is when they believe they're doing something that will lead them somewhere when it never will. We know too many people who have gone down this long path thinking, I do it every day, we all do it. If we don't reflect, and it leads down a path towards something that we thought we, we really wanted when it won't. How would we know that? This requires reflection. But let's, let's think about it for a second though. I'll, I'll make this real for someone. If someone were to take a piece of paper and write down and fold it in half long ways like a hot dog, this is so simple. On the left-hand side, if they were to write down every single thing they do in a day, everything from changing diapers to working, working out, you know, doing the business, whatever, they immediately would see on one half side of the, of the paper their entire life, on average, show up, which is startling. Most people would never write this stuff down, at least on one half sheet of paper. And I've done this with, with clients, and I'll share with you some of the, what, what's happened. If you, like, circle the things you like and want to do, and write them on the right-hand side, you all of a sudden see this imbalance. Here's all the things I'm doing, but here's only the pieces of it that I like and want to do. This creates imbalance. The reason I say what you like and want to do is because most people will go and take a strengths test and say, I'm really good at this, and I'm going to double down on strengths, only to find out later that they don't like their strengths and they want to do something else. But the corporation is intentionally, I don't think people understand that strengths tests were not designed to help people be like necessarily just this is all, you, all you're going to do. Like it is made so that a, a corporate person can say you can't have this other job because you're not good at that. This test said you're good at this. We're not here to teach you anything new. We're here so you can keep doing what you're already good at. So if someone's really good at laying bricks, they will lay bricks forever because they go, this is what I'm good at. This is what they told me I'm going to do. And they, they move forward with that. You might not want to lay bricks. So when you don't want to lay bricks, this is why you, you put down what you like and want to do. You don't have to focus on your strengths anymore, unless you like your strengths. And if you were to 
go down that list and eliminate, delegate, and outsource every single thing you don't like and want to do. And I get it, it comes up. I don't have enough time. I don't have education. I don't have experience. I don't have money. I get all that. We can we can address that. But if you were to eliminate, delegate, and outsource every single thing on that list that you don't like and want to do, then the left hand side and the right hand side will be balanced, just like a balance sheet. Everything I like and want to do is everything I like and want to do, and I'm doing it. But balance is a weird word because balance actually, you know, in physics means motionless. It doesn't move. We don't want balance. So the idea now is how can I appropriately move my life from a negative imbalance to balance to then an imbalance in the direction I want it to go? The whole 80-20 rule, you free up 80% of your time now only doing what you like and want to do. All your responsibilities are still handled. And now you can do more of what you like and want to do. What this looks like is I had some a, a client ask me, she said she didn't like what she was doing for work anymore. And I said, really? Do you really not like what you're doing? Or are you just not making enough money? Like if you're making more money, would you like it? She goes, yeah, I would like it, but I don't want to do the work to do all the money, you know, to do all the money things, to get the money, you know, it's, it goes on and on and on. It's an endless cycle. I said, ask a better question, get a better answer. If you're telling yourself, I can't do this thing because these reasons, your brain works like a calculator and says, you're right. You can't do that. That's not the way it works in the world. But if you say, how can I do this thing without this bad thing happening by Tuesday? Well, then you can come up with, you can create space in your mind to, just to solve the problem. So she went from making, with this one thought, her thought was, how can I have more time with my kids and make more money without doing all this work that I don't want to do, only focusing on the things I like and want to do? So to the person, to answer your question, that wants to start from the very beginning doing it on the right foot, start from your purpose, then the payments. Most people start with payments and expect to find their purpose way out on the fringe of their life. It's a completely different life to say, I'm going to get a job, I'm going to live in this city, which decides my lifestyle, decides when I work, what I'm going to do. It's a very different choice than saying, I'm going to go on the road for six months with my cell phone and work from it and find ways to support what I'm doing. So what this girl did, she's amazing. She ended up within that month making more money that month than she ever made. I think she made like 30 grand that month when she was only making usually around three grand. It was something like that. And it was not the money though. The money was just simply a consequence of her focusing on offers instead of doing work that never produced income, Right. So most people will say, I'm not making money. And as soon as you say, when's the last time you asked someone to pay you? Their eyes roll back and, and they're like, I never asked someone to pay me. How do you expect to make money? If you think making money means working, then have you worked a day in your life if you're not asking people to pay you? Work could be anything you define it as. But if you're going to define it as money generating activities, focus on money generating activities. So she did that freed up all of her time. And the one thing she said, I'll never forget it. She said, Richie, and she's crying. I spent the day with my boys at the skate park. I haven't done that. And it had nothing to do with, she couldn't, she didn't have to make that much money to do that. She was at the skate park before she was able to make the money because it made her think differently of how she spent her time, when and where. I can give you a million examples, but there's a lot of stuff to unpack there. <laughs> yeah. There is for sure. And, and thank you for that. You know, on this exercise, which is very clear that you could do right now if you wanted to with the hot dog paper. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Left side, right side. That's right. How do we help a person who's doing that exercise who sees a long list on the left hand side? How do we figure out what the first steps are to start, you know, outsourcing and, and delegating those things? And, you know, is it bad if there's still things on that list that just seem like, I got to change the diaper still. Like, I'm not going to, you know, hire somebody to just come over and change diapers. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, this is good. Let me give sort of a framework and then and then answer that, like, specifically. So the idea is, if you've been to Europe or you, you're a fan of castles, they'll have a castle and then they'll have a moat in a lot of cases. The idea is build the castle, then the moat. The purpose is the castle, the family, the time. The moat would be a strategic moat of how you work to support that style of life and then how you get paid changing how you how you're paid changes more about your life arguably more than anything else you do because it, it dictates exactly what you do when and where and how okay 
So when you're going on the list, I'm, a, I'm not a huge fan of lists. This is more just a representation of what's already happening in your life. Not a list of things to do. It's a list of things you do every day. These are not goals. This is not the past. This is not the future. Because when you look at that list, most people are also thinking in their head, I'm doing this because I'm avoiding all this pain that I've ex experienced in the past. And I'm doing it because of all the success I want that I've had in the past that will lead me towards this future that I want. But to the rest of us, to our, to our children, to our spouses, to our coworkers, they don't see our past or the future that's in our head. All they see is how we show up and how we, on that piece of paper, that's how we show up. So when you go down the list, you're obviously going to know that every single one you can get rid of gives you immediately back your time. More than just like, say it was an hour for each thing you would do. It gives you back your mental bandwidth. This is huge. The keyword there was which ones can you delegate? Can you outsource? Like happiness is not on the everything is, is gone from this side of the list. And now only things are on this right side of the list, right? No, I'm glad you're digging into this. So, so yeah, you have this whole list. You have to remember, like you chose, at the, again, there's a lot to this, but in essence, we all choose the responsibility that we have. Even though I didn't choose for all the terrible things that happened in my life, at, in, at some way, shape or form, the things I'm doing today was a choice of, of yesterday, right? Aside from, from, from random acts or things like that. So you're, you're literally just looking at it going, this is my life. For the listeners, like, ask yourself this question. What thing could I literally get rid of that wouldn't impact anyone negatively if it didn't get done? And you'd think that there's nothing there like that. But you'll be surprised how much is there like that, okay? And I'm not talking about getting rid of, like, little luxuries or even just wasting your time on social media or not or, like, digging your way into email. Whatever it is, if there's something you can get rid of that you don't have to do anymore and it won't hurt someone negatively, eliminate it. You got your time back. You got your bandwidth back. Delegate in this sense to me does not mean you pay anybody. It also doesn't necessarily mean you're dumping your trash on someone else. Other people like doing things that I don't like doing. Yeah, that was a huge realization for me. Like, can you say that one more time? Because I think, you know, for, for me, it's like bookkeeping or, you know, financial stuff. It's like, I don't want to deal with any of that stuff. Exactly. But there are people who that's their passion. That's what they love. And so everybody wins in that case. That's right. Everyone wins in that case. Other people like doing what I don't like doing. And if you have, again, with delegation, I'm thinking not having to pay somebody yet. There are other people that like, you might not even have a team. You might not have anything. I get it. It could also be software. Like there could be something that is automated, you know, that you already have to do this. But if you can move it, you don't like it. You're good at it. You do it because you obviously feel like you're the only one that can. That's why you're still doing it. But if you don't like it, is there someone or something or some software where it can be quote unquote delegated, where it's better suited for them? They'll probably do it better than you would anyways. And people freak out about that, but it's actually a very simple process and it's totally possible and it doesn't have to be permanent. Yeah, true. You don't have to say it forever. You can say one time as a test because I'm freaked out that you're going to get it wrong. And before you do it, I'm going to make, you, you know, all of a sudden you're a micromanager. That's the problem is, this is the real problem with delegating out is we give ourselves a new job as a micromanager. So if you can delegate it out, just put like a little D next to it. Like I'm going to delegate this out at some point to someone. It doesn't all have to happen at the same time, obviously. And certain responsibilities that you don't like doing but you feel like you need to, like obviously like certain things like caregiving for your family, you're still going to do, but there are some things that you don't need to. So it's subjective. Outsourcing would be absolutely paying someone else to mow the lawn, paying someone to do the taxes, paying someone to build the funnels, paying someone to edit the, the, the podcast, paying someone to do whatever, 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 the editing the videos. It goes on and on and on. But this is the key. This is the key. Pat. I know you've experienced this yourself. The key is not to hire somebody that you have to teach how to do it. Because if you have to teach someone how to do it, you've given yourself two jobs. One, the job of teaching them. And two, the job of getting it done. If possible, hire someone who is an expert at it, who probably knows how to do it better than you. And by the way, in the freelancer world, these people are probably less expensive than bringing some intern or some employee in-house 
because they own their own business. They do this for a living and they love it. They're 25 bucks per project instead of 250 bucks a week. This is the real deal, man. Yeah. You could also pro bono some stuff too. Maybe you have a skill that you're passionate about and you can borrow somebody else's skill that they're passionate about and kind of they need yours. And so you can kind of, you know, do an exchange there, I think, especially for those bootstrapping or just in the beginning. Um, you know, for example, well, to your point on outsourcing, first of all, like when I started to learn just how much time I was getting back, but again, it wasn't even about the time I was getting back. It was what did that time now open up for me to be able to do, to spend more time with the kids and to, you know, dive into other projects and to experiment with the switch pod and other things like that. Absolutely. But if I was just starting out, and I didn't have a lot of money. I think that I would figure out what my superpowers were and see who needs that, who can also help me. And we can kind of work together. And so, you know, there's ways to, to go about it, even if you don't think there are. Absolutely. And the thing is, again, I'll just repeat this, like, focus on ends, not means. There are a zillion ways to climb a mountain. But if the goal is to just be on the mountain, and the goal is not necessarily to climb it barefoot, why are you climbing it barefoot? Get a helicopter if you can, get a donkey, you know, a gondola, whatever, like, if the goal isn't the climb and the goal is the result, then you have a thousand different ways to get something done. Zillions. So we illogically choose activities that we, we think will be the easiest, fastest, and cheapest to get something done that don't lead us to where we want to go. But when you choose, like, I'll just say this word, we can, we can, we can talk more about it, but when you choose like purpose first instead of payments first, you will find ways to work that allow you to keep purpose first that crowd out the distractions. And then I'll, I'll give you another another tool like that, that whole like one sheet paper worksheet thing, that's a tool. I'll, I'll share another one. But you know, I don't know if people know this. I don't really share it this much, but I started working for my cell phone, Pat, 20 years ago. Cell phones didn't look like an iPhone. They folded over, man. You know that 20 years ago, Facebook didn't exist. No YouTube. No Instagram. I don't think there were any podcasts. I don't know. Maybe, maybe someone recorded a thing. I think it was called radio back in the day. You know, <laughs> this is real. The reason I say this is because it is so easy today. Easy in quotes. It's also obviously difficult. But 20 years ago, when I said I'm only going to work for myself, and it was because I wanted to be able to travel with my family around the world and still make money. It was because I lived in Brazil and, and saw like incredible where I was at. Not, not, I guess, everywhere in the country, but I was in favelas where it was extreme poverty, you know, and I've met people from all kinds of, you know, different walks of life. And I told myself, I don't want to wait till I'm 65 and retired to live the life I want to live with my family. But how am I going to contribute to the world and add value and help other people become self-reliant and do all this fun stuff, whatever, if I don't have money myself? And that's, I got into social entrepreneurship. My first business was actually a cashmere company in Mongolia. And I started doing business all over the Asia Pacific Rim, Philippines, Western Samoa, Fiji, all, all over the place. Long story short, I told myself, I'm only going to work for my cell phone. The reason this is important is because this created what's called a forcing function in psychology, which allowed me to say, if I can't go to the office, if I can't necessarily be seeing people in person, Although I can and I will if I need to or want to, if I'm not going to always be plugged into a computer, how am I still going to get the result? Offices are means. Goals are means. Habits are means. These are all just tools leading us towards what we really want. But when I worked from what I really wanted, the freedom, I didn't limit myself in, in my thinking. I limited myself in saying what tools would stop me from being able to live that freedom. It allowed me to create ways to do it. That's making sense. You said you had another exercise. So here's what I would do. I call it the four P's. And if you were to take a piece of paper and fold it in half like a hot dog, but then half again like a hamburger. So there's four squares, okay? And you were to write at the top of each one small so you can like have more room to write. And I'll go through this quickly, obviously. But if you were to write uh, personal, professional, people, and play. And you were to write on the personal one. This is self-care. It's not selfish. All the things that you need for self-care. If on the professional side, you wrote down all the things, getting out of debt, making money, starting business, learning, buying courses, listening to past podcasts, another good P there. Okay, okay, okay. Then you go over to the people, put your spouse, put your kids, put 
people that you need to make amends with, people that you love, people you don't want to lose touch with, coworkers, play, put down things that make you excited, things you want to do, contributions you want to make to the world. If you were to do that, you'd see we're moving from your present life on the last tool to your future life that you want to step into. Not two years from now, because people think five, 10 years ahead. But if you think, Pat, think of the Pat Flynn in 2012. That Pat Flynn is a different human, different life, different situation, different financial situation. Everything is different. So again, we we start making plans for 2032 or we're thinking way out in the future. We, we won't even want the goals we have today then. We'll be a different person. So it's really important to then move that idea of the future to the present because you can become that person now. So once you have these four things set up, you can go through and either eliminate them all until you find the one you really want. But essentially, if you circle the only one that you really, really, really find the most important and circle, you, you, you narrow it down to four things. One for each quadrant? One for each quadrant. So you then you could say, what are the chances that if I did this thing, that all the other things would also fall into place? I've done this activity for years and with my clients for years. This thing moves mountains, man. Because it be, these four things become your North Star. So every time you make a decision, you can ask, does it make this thing happen? Does it lead me closer to it? Or does it move me further away? And if it moves you further away, it doesn't mean you have to say no. It just means you can consciously make decisions and stop tricking yourself into thinking that something you're going to do is going to get you something that you want or wanted. And then you can change the goal if you need to. This is so important. Let's just make it, let's make it super real. Like if I said like, for me personally, it's like, I'm just making stuff up. Let's say it's like fitness stuff. Let's say, let's say money is making seven figures. Let's say that family, I'm going to put my wife as my most important relationship and all things, of course, will they're all important, but I'm going to focus on her. And let's say the last one is like, let's just say the last one's like donating a bunch of money to some organization. Let's just say it's that, or it's traveling around the world, but like doing social entrepreneurial things, something, something that contributes to other people's lives. I did this. I did this. I've done it for years, but I'll tell you the last time I, one of the most important times I did it was 10 years ago. As I'm almost getting emotional thinking about it, but that was, that was right after our son passed away. It moved me from Hawaii to Arizona, which is a weird thing to say, but I wanted to get an executive MBA at Thunderbird, the number one international business school in the world. It was just something I wanted to do. It was there that we met our foster kids. It was then that I published my first book, The Power of Starting Something Stupid, because I wanted to become an author guy. I wanted to become an entrepreneur guy, which led to creating Prodec, which led to creating my video editing company, which led to creating all kinds of things, which has led to these conversations, which led to this, this book now. This one activity changed everything for me because I realized who I wanted to become. And instead of telling myself, I'm going to become it later, I said, no, to become it, I have to become it now. At least the parts that I can. So I worked from the goal, not towards the goal. That's a huge, I mean, that's a, that's the biggest realization for me here today in listening to this. And I think for a lot of people is, is the goal is not the reason, right? And that's, that's huge. Cause we talk about goal setting all the time. We've had specific podcast episodes. We've brought in people like Michael Hyatt on to teach us how to create the right goals and goal setting is important. It's, you know, you want them to be measurable. You want them to be a little bit risky and all that stuff to help push you and out of your boundaries and your comfort zone and, and whatnot. But then it's like, for what? Like, what's that goal going to do for us? And so, yes, that's it. You know, a lot of us can't answer that question because we're just like, I don't know. I just want to get the goal. And then, you know, that should open up things for us. But like now it's like, wow, we aren't even like, like we're working day to day. We're using these tactics to try to grow or scale or get time back or whatever. But when we're there, it's like, okay, well then what? And, you know, it's like, if you have this why in mind, and we, we hear about this all the time. I just like the way that you're putting it because it, it's more tangible and now there's consequence if we don't think about it, right? And so, yeah, keep, keep, keep going because I, and, and like, how do we differentiate from or figure out goal versus why? So this is, this is good. I, I never said this in a podcast before too, but what I grappled with in writing the book was vocabulary because there's not vocabulary. A goal can be brush my teeth every day or a goal can be make a million dollars. It's a weird word. It's a catch-all. It's not fair. It's not a fair word. Okay. So I tried to change some of the vocabulary in the book to help us think differently, but let's sticking with our regular vocabulary of, of goals. You said the right thing. And it's a question that I, I asked people like, okay, so what does a goal do for you? 
this helps you understand it. So it's not just some weird thing. It's like, what does it do for you? 99% of the time, we're not doing a goal to get a goal. We're doing a goal for something else. Okay, there's an ancient philosophy around this by Aristotle, and he called it final cause. There's four causes. And it's like there's like material for something that you need. There's uh, like some sort of like design to create it. There's an agent, a person to make it. And there's final cause, which is the last thing. In essence, an acorn becomes an oak tree. So why are we, if we want an oak tree, why are we planting some other seed? If we want time, freedom and stuff, why are we not planting that into our business immediately? Why are we not baking it in from the start? So with goals, to me, and we'll, I'll talk about final cause in a second, but to me, a goal from experience is a task. You've done it before. How is that a goal? You're just doing it again. But a goal outside experience is growth. That requires creative thinking and diligence and commitment. But when somebody comes to me and says, I'm going to start a business to start a gym. This is a real one. And they start a gym and they make a ton of money. And they say, but I'm not happy. And it's like, how you have so much, you're, a, you're an entrepreneur, you have money, you're not happy. I, I get happiness is like a whole thing. I get it, I get it, I get it. I'm not trying to simplify it too much, but well, no, no, I want more time to be able to travel with my family to Italy for two months out of the year. Now, this is actually a conversation we had. This was all like before he ended up doing it. He said he was going to quit his $250,000 job as an accountant to start a gym, but he needed two gyms to be profitable. I'm just listening. And he's like, because I want my time back so I can go spend a couple months out of the year in Italy. Sounds like a great goal to me. How long will it take you for you to like be profitable and to have to be free and do what you want? He says, five years. How old are your kids? And he says, 13 and 15. I'm not trying to be rude here, man. I'm being really nice too, obviously. I'm like, you understand your kids will be 18 and 20 when you finally have freedom, right? And I said, it's not that you can't start the freaking gym. It's just you have to operate it differently. Oh, no, I'm a micromanager. O okay, well, now we're talking real because you can hire a manager and have the gym running. You can do one of those 24-7 things where they put the card in and out and nobody's there. You could make it virtual. Once you realize the goal is actually to have freedom with your time with your family, the idea of the gym becomes obsolete. It's one of a thousand options. It's not about the business. It's about how you operate the business. Game changer. So with final cause, if you wanted to make the, the example people use sometimes is a, a table. You need wood, you need design, you need a person to put it together, and then you finally have a table. But if the, what's the goal of the table? If the goal of the table is just to have a nice dinner with your family tonight, you can just do Uber Eats. You don't need a table at all. You wasted all that time and money on something that is uh, totally unnecessary. If the table is supposed to be a legacy table that lasts for years for your family, sure. Why not? So the idea isn't to take away all the things that need to get done. It's to take away the things that are unnecessary because a full calendar is an empty life in many cases. And to create space so that when terrible tragedies happen, you can still have the flexibility, which I define as autonomy, availability, and ability. Those three things. You can make your own choices. You're available to do it when you want to, and you're able to do it. And we all have different grades of possibility within those three ideas. But at the end of the day, I'm telling a person right now, yes, you can coach your kid's baseball team. Yes, you can go to the recital. And yes, you can make money. And you know what else? You're responsible. You're going to get it done in less time in a different way. You just have to think differently. Because we've been taught for 200 years, Pat, to have someone else tell us exactly what to do. And we're going to do it. And now that we're entrepreneurs, no one's here to tell us what to do. So we do it the way we thought we learned. <laughs> that's so true. I mean, that's, we're, we're not trained to think on our own. We used to be. We're not. And then it went away. Yeah. Yeah. On purpose. True. Yeah. And you think like our, our ancestors or whatever, even our parents, grandparents, they didn't have this opportunity. They built it for us. We might as well take advantage of it. Dude, we could talk for hours. And this philosophical sort of approach to life and business, something is it, we don't talk about here often on the on the podcast. I like to get into these deep conversations. I'm so glad that you helped initiate this today. I hope it helps a lot of people who are listening too. And if they want to check out the book, Richie, where should they go to, to check it out? Thank you. Yeah, it's available on Amazon now and Barnes and Noble now. And it's also like on crazy places like Target and Walmart. It's everywhere. So you can go now. 
and grab that. And I'd, I'd really appreciate it. I think it'll help you. You know what I'm hearing from people, Pat, when as they get like early copies of it, I'm hearing them say, these are like senior engineer type people that are saying, I've never heard of this before. They're saying, I've never heard of anything being done this way. I wish I had it earlier. It's pretty profound to turn your purpose into a project and then to get paid for it. It's a revolution, man. It makes sense. And as somebody who's been able to do that, it's beautiful. And now we have like a roadmap and somebody to help us through a lot of the psychoanalysis that happens uh, with yourself when you're going through that process. Because I mean, I wrote about it in my book, like, oh, it's just so new and different. And and I, I wanted to crawl back to the thing where a person could tell me what to do just because I was so used to that. But I'm glad I actually was forced not to do that because I couldn't get a new job even after I got laid off. And I went in for interviews and stuff. So I'm, I'm grateful that I was, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a choice, but we always have that choice right now. And you can choose to go and get the book and check it out and support Richie here. And Richie supported me and I'm going to support him, which is why he's here in the show today. So bro, I appreciate you so much. Thank you for coming on. I want to wish you the best of luck with the book. I hope it goes far and wide as it should. And I hope it starts a, a movement for people. Thank you so much. And you're the perfect example and all the people you teach are the perfect examples of being able to do this. So I'm, I'm grateful to be chatting here with you, man. You're the best. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richie. Appreciate you. And everybody go check out product.com as well. And we'll have all the links in the show notes. I'll tell you where to go in just a minute. But thanks again, man. Appreciate you. Love you, man. Thanks. All right. I hope you enjoyed that deep conversation with Richie Norton there. A lot of big realizations. Hopefully something unlocked for you there today. But again, Richie's book, Anti-Time Management, can be found wherever books are at right now. You can also check out his company, Product, if you are ever interested in creating like physical products that you can then sell to your audience. And just again, him and his team are amazing. But anti-time management, what a great conversation. Really, really big realizations today from my perspective and hopefully for you too. Let me know what you thought of the show. Hit me up at Pat Flynn on Instagram and or Twitter. And I look forward to serving you in the next episode. And again, if you haven't already done so, check out SPI Pro. We have an amazing community of hundreds of entrepreneurs just like you, people who are there not just to ask questions and get help, but also there to support you on your journey as well. In fact, it is the number one thing that people have provided the most positive feedback for that we've created in our history at SPI and anything I've ever created, in fact. There are business partnerships happening, masterminds being formed, all the things that you would need to support your business endeavors are there. So go ahead and check it out, apply, see if it's the right fit for you. Go to spipro.com and I look forward to reading your application and seeing you in there. So again, spipro.com. Thank you so, so much for listening all the way through. I appreciate you. And I look forward to serving you in the next episode. Until then, cheers, peace out, take care. And as always, Team Flynn for the win. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to the Smart Passive Income podcast at smartpassiveincome.com. I'm your host, Pat Flynn. Our senior producer is Sarah Jane Hess. Our series producer is David Grabowski. And our executive producer is Matt Gartland. Sound editing by Duncan Brown. The Smart Passive Income Podcast is a production of SPI Media. We'll catch you in the next session. Hey, if you're looking for a new podcast to add to your rotation, I've got one for you. It's called Dirty Money, and it's like a hybrid between a true crime and a business podcast. So hosts Jonathan Small and Dan Bova tell the tales of legendary scammers, con artists, and barely legal lowlifes who stop at nothing to rake in millions. Recent episodes include a man who looted $100 million from his own company. Crazy. Give it a listen. Head on over to Dirty Money right now on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher.